Welcome, League members and guests. I am Bonnie McNeil, Voter Services Chair for the League of Women Voters Deerfield area. I'm happy to welcome you to the candidate forum for the Village of Deerfield trustee candidates. Our program is being held through the Zoom webinar platform and will be recorded and published as soon as possible. Rebroadcast or excerpting from the proceedings or the recordings are not allowed. League of Women Voters is a 100 year old organization that is proudly nonpartisan. We never support a party or candidate, but we do have positions on certain public policy issues. We encourage informed and active participation in government, work to increase understanding of major public policy issues, and influence public policy through education and advocacy. We stand firm in our commitment to empower voters and defend democracy. Our commitment to these principles is honored through the sponsorship of programs such as this forum, the creation of the Illinois Voters Guide, a nonpartisan compilation of candidates in all Illinois races, and in our support for voter registration and education programs throughout the year. Today's forum is sponsored by League of Women Voters of Deerfield area. We are always happy to welcome new members, so please let us know if you would like information about joining our league. I would now like to introduce our moderator, Pat Wilder, who will explain the guidelines for today's forum and introduce the candidates. It should be noted that under league rules, the moderator may not reside within the election district of the candidates participating in the forum. Pat joined the League of Women Voters when she moved to Chicago seven years ago. She chose to participate in League Voter Services and concentrated her efforts as the coordinator for Chicago High School voter registration and information. As coordinator, she arranged voter registration events and League volunteers with high school, fa with high school faculty, presented voter information to civics classes, and supplied League and Chicago Board of Elections materials to schools. During the past school disclosures, she also participated in recorded interviews with civics teachers for presentation to their classes. In 2019, she helped coordinate two aldermanic forums, which included high school student participation. Thank you, Pat, for being with us today. I also want to thank everybody for welcoming and welcome the candidates to this forum. And thank you very much for inviting me to be your moderator. For the benefit of the audience, I'm going to explain some procedures for the forum, which each of the candidates have received ahead of time. You'll have 90 seconds for an opening statement, 90 seconds for a closing statement, and two minutes to answer each of the questions. Opening statements will be offered in alphabetical order by last name, and then reversed for the closing statements. Candidates will alternate the order when speaking uh, for the questions. Candidate statements and responses will be timed. The league will be providing timekeepers who will show candidates the remaining time on each question or statement and unused time may not be carried over to later questions or statements. When <laughs> there is a half minute left on your speaking time, the timekeeper will hold up a card that says 30 seconds, indicating you have 30 seconds to finish your answer. At 15 seconds, the timekeeper will hold up a card that says 15 seconds. Please wrap up your answer at that time. If you continue speaking after the stop card is held up, I'll say thank you. And I will move on to the next speaker. Since Mrs. Mrs. Childers is um, uh, traveling, she's going to be getting some verbal cues so she'll know when the, her times are up. Candidates will have two minutes, like I said, to answer each of the questions posed by me. They must restrict their answers to the questions asked. Exchanges between the candidates and personal references or attacks on other candidates will be ruled out of order. We're here for you to present your case for, the quali for your qualifications. Questions have been determined prior to the forum by the League of Women Voters, so we will not be accepting questions from the audience, which means that the chat uh, option will be closed. The questions were provided to the candidates beforehand. I'll, I'll begin by introducing the four candidates in alphabetical sure order who are vying for sure, three trustee positions. Robert L. Bob Benton, Christopher M. Goodsnyder. Good afternoon. 
Rebecca Childers, Metz Childers. Hello. Mary Myros Oppenheim. Hi. Okay, if you're ready, um, we, candidates, we can begin with your opening statements. Okay, Robert, uh, Mr. Benton, may you, you may begin. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to the league. Uh, I've watched the league operate over the years and uh, they have been efficient. And uh, this is a wonderful way of communicating. So again, thanks. Uh, I've been a part of Deerfield's life. We counted for about 47 years in very, very uh, assorted and interesting positions within the village. Uh, I've been in charge of their ad hoc first and later formal transportation committee. I've been a member of plan commission and a member of the board looking for a fourth term. I think it's a very interesting job and a way to assist in planning for the life of the village. Uh, I'm pleased to be here. All right, Mr. Goodsnyder, would you care to continue? Yes, thank you so much. Let me begin by thanking the, uh, the League of Women Voters and um, the moderators, Pat Wilder, thank you so much for your time for, and the, the League for organizing the program. I'd also like to thank each of the potential voters who've taken time away from their day to learn more about our backgrounds and views on issues impacting Deerfield now and in the future. My name is Chris Goodsnyder. Together with my best friend and wife for 28 years, Jamie, we've raised our family in Deerfield for 20 years. Jamie is a veteran elementary school teacher in a neighboring school district and helps me keep current on things impacting families with school-aged children. Our son, Jeremy, graduated last year from Brandeis University with a degree in anthropology and environmental studies and is currently working at a nonprofit in the Florida Keys battling climate change in, in the coral reefs. Our daughter, Lauren, is a junior at U of I uh, studying um, elementary education. I'm running for village trustee as an independent in hopes of bringing uh, an even, making Deerfield an even better place to live, work, shop, raise, and family, raise a family, and retire. Over the course of my 27 years as an attorney, I've concentrated my practice in complex civil litigation in state and federal courts. Uh, I have a wide range of community involvement from soccer coach, booster club member, uh, Mitchell Park Advisory Committee, Deerfield Park Foundation, and uh, District 109 School Board Caucus. I've gained skills through my professional and personal life that have taught me to be analytical, strategic, a good listener, and empathetic. I hope to have the opportunity to apply these skills to a position as a member of the Deerfield Village Board. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Ms. Ms. Metz Childers. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you all for having me and I appreciate the opportunity to do this only by phone as we make our long way back from Florida. Uh, I'm Rebecca Metz Childers and I'm running for the village board because it's, you know, the board and the village are facing a lot of important conversations that impact all of our residents. I'm very interested in bringing a new voice to that, one that's curious and, and thinking about some of the key social issues that the world is facing like we never have before. I have a lot of things I'd like to bring to that conversation, not the least of which is that I'm a mom of a fourth and a sixth grader. So I'm committed to this community at multiple levels. I'm a partner at a communications consulting firm and we focus on critical issues. And what that means is I'm thinking about business and society and financial issues on a regular basis. And I think I'll be able to bring some of those skills to the board as well. And finally, I'm a connector and I'd love to bring that forward to ensure that as a board, we're really representing our entire community. So thanks again for having me. I look forward to today's conversation. Thank you very much. And Ms. Oppenheimer. Huh. Thank you. Oppenheimer, I'm sorry. That's okay. I'm Mary Oppenheim. I've lived in Deerfield for 40 years. I served on the Village Plan Commission for seven years and I'm in my second term as a village trustee. During my tenure on the board, the village built a new wastewater treatment facility. We re rebuilt roads and bridges using federal grants and low interest bonds. We adopted more sustainable refuse and recycling services and programs that supported renewable energy and save residents on their electric bills. Yeah. We added new residential developments that included affordable housing. We passed an assault weapons ban. We solicited and welcomed new businesses to the village, all while maintaining Deerfield's AAA bond rating. My vision for Deerfield is of a community with top quality services and state-of-the-art infrastructure. 
I want a community that's safe and affordable, where residents get involved and everybody feels like they have a sense of belonging. We need to maintain our solid tax base and a vibrant bus business district. I'm dedicated to a village government that's transparent in its operations, responsive to our residents' needs and open to new ideas. This past year has been pretty tough, but I'm confident we have the ability to move forward and tackle whatever challenges that the future brings. Thanks, and I'm eager to answer your questions. All right, thank you very much. All right, let's begin with the questioning. Uh, Mr. Good Good Snyder, you're going to be going first. Um, the first question is, how would you help locally owned small businesses as we emerge from the pandemic? Well, um, I've come up with what I think might be a useful um, slogan, uh, which is Deerfield, we're open for business. And I'd like to um, make Deerfield uh, a place for all businesses to stay and relocate if necessary from uh, neighborhood boutiques to the Fortune 100 companies that call Deerfield home. Um, I've had a chance uh, to discuss the pandemic issues with a few local businesses and they were I was quite disappointed to hear how little support they received from the village in terms of um, flexibility in operations and uh, funding uh, additional costs that they faced during the pandemic. So if we ever in a situation like this again, I'd want to have a set aside to help uh, those businesses operate during the pandemic. You know, if it's, uh, you know, using parking spaces to have outdoor seating, um, helping them with the added costs. So. Um, marketing Deerfield as a, as a place to shop, live, and, uh, and work, and uh, supporting our businesses with uh, necessary funding if need be. Okay, thank you very much. Ms. Um, uh, Metz Childers, you're next. You want me to repeat Please. the question? Nope, I think I have it. Okay. Um, you know, I, I think there's two ways to think about it in that there's the way small businesses have had to face the pandemic. And certainly that's been incredibly difficult. I know that, um, you know, the sales tax revenue dropping really does impact the village and what services we're able to provide to residents. And I do see that the current board has got some opportunities to cut fees and change regulations to support them. I also think the future is gonna be really important and it's, it's always a challenge and always a really important focus area, I think, for the board to bring in new small business. We talk a lot about bringing diversity into the village. And one of the ways to do that is by attracting new businesses that are diverse in their, what they're selling, in their ownership, and in what the community looks for. So I think there's some creativity we're going to need to bring forward there. All right. Thank you. Um, Ms. Oppenheim. Thanks. Um, you know, I think we need to look at, at, at the near future as an opportunity for us to change some of the ways we've been doing things. And uh, the village has, in fact, made a lot of accommodations to small businesses to waive fees and change regulations. But as these businesses also are responding to a, a nationwide and a global uh, trend toward online shopping and are, are dealing with that, we may have to be even more creative in terms of allowing more parking for curbside pickup and, um, you know, online shopping, that kind of thing. However, at this point, the Deerfield um, Chamber of Commerce has worked very closely with the village, and I think we have to keep that partnership up. The village has to be a cheerleader. The village has to support businesses by having registers of them, uh, letting people know what's here, what where they can shop. We need to showcase businesses when we have our festivals. We do that now. We need to increase it. Um, and I think that we need to let people know that what they need is here in town. I think Chris's slogan is great. Let's use all the slogans we can get. Um, but we also have to make sure that um, we keep our tax base such that our residents can afford to shop in town. So it's a big picture, it's all connected together. And um, I think that with some outreach, a great uh, partnership with the Chamber of Commerce and um, some creative regulation, we can certainly help businesses bounce back. Thanks. Hey, thank you very much. Okay, Mr. Benton. We have already begun that, <clears throat> excuse me, the process 
uh, we have reduced the taxes to a number of our uh, in-town companies, the hotels, the restaurants. We've uh, cut back on, on some of the fees that they have had to pay. And uh, we've done that carefully so as not to interfere with our finances, but to help theirs. Unfortunately, by the geography of Deerfield, we don't have a lot of places where we can block off a sidewalk to allow uh, tables out there. We've done as much as we can with it, and we're trying to favor that, and especially with uh, curbside pickup. Uh, the restaurants, those that are continuing, have uh, done that rather well. Uh, unfortunately, the restaurant business suffered a great deal from the pandemic, and we've lost a few. Uh, we've brought in some new uh, companies or uh, businesses in those spaces, and uh, as our mayor has said, uh, she prefers to have retail because that produces the sales taxes. These days, that's not quite possible, but we'll work the best we can. But in the meantime, we're going to continue. Uh, I second Mary's uh, nomination of the chamber. They're working quite hard uh, to stimulate the business for Deerfield. We've continued with the farmer's market. We've continued with in different ways with some of the things to bring people into town. And uh, Rebecca has been uh, extraordinary with the commission that she serves on. So I think that's a good sign. Uh, we're gonna continue that. And we're gonna make sure that as this snaps back, we're gonna snap back with it and attract new businesses and the best we can within the village. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. All right, on to question two and Ms. Metz Childers, you'll be answering first. Two affordable housing pro proposals have been delayed substantially, one for lack of HUD funding and one to evaluate the future of Deerbrook. How would you address affordable housing? Thanks, uh, you know, I'm very supportive of continuing to progress our affordable housing options and the discussions around the inclusionary zoning ordinance. We're not just talking, I know about how to bring in new residents when we talk about this, but also how to allow some of our current residents to buy in town and in a town where housing is quite expensive. I, I certainly have friends who have two well-paying jobs and, and still find it difficult often to buy in Deerfield. So um, I, I think there is more discussion to be had around what affordable housing means. Um, I've, I've seen a lot of the work that the board has been doing on looking at neighboring communities and how they're scoping. And I think there's more discussion to be had for sure there. Um, and then I also think we have to consider how we can support inclusivity once houses are available. Um, diversity is really important to me. And, and as it's, uh, you want, well, you can attract people, but we have to be a very inclusive and welcoming town as well and ensure that um, they feel like they're part of the community. So I look forward to more discussions on how we're gonna work on that as well. Thanks. Okay, Ms. Oppenheim. Thanks, Pat. Um, well, first of all, the good news is with um, uh, Zion Woods, the development that had been stalled because of the problem with the HUD money, we have been told recently that they will be able to complete their project with financing from the state. Mm -hmm. So that project should still go through. Uh, best case scenario, they'll break ground this fall. So we're still very hopeful that that is going to be accomplished. Um, as far as ensuring the fact that we move forward and maintain affordable housing in the community, the first thing we have to do is pass the ordinance. We have to put the final language together, pass it so all developers know what's expected of them so we can always have that in place for when other development comes along. And we have to keep up our contacts with the Housing Opportunity Development Corporation and others that uh, work in this area. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. All right, Mr. Benton. Yes, it's important to understand that this situation, affordable housing, which is something that I think all of us believe in and uh, feel that the village needs and provides a service that is desperately needed, is not just a solution on our part. It also has to consider the people who are building the buildings. Right. The developers are used to affordable housing they are accepting it in other communities and they are accepting it here. But we just simply can't set up a number and say 30%, 10%, 15%. They have to agree. They have their own needs to make a profit on their developments. And they are doing that. So while they are doing that, we are studying and talking to them 
and getting their approval. The developments that have gone in, the ones on Deerfield Road, the ones on Lake Cook Road, have readily accepted it. And we think others will too, but it's just not a question of saying, we'll pick a number and that will be the way we do it. Uh, it is important for a number of reasons. And uh, we continue to work on those ordinances through the plan commission and then through the supervision of the village board. And we will continue that, thanks. All right, thank you, Mr. Goodsnyder. Thank you. Um, I believe that um, affordable, providing affordable housing to attract and keep new families to Deerfield should be a priority because it expands the number of people who would benefit from being part of such a wonderful community. Our families have access to world-class public and religious-based education, phenomenal, phenomenal recreation facilities, a wide variety of shopping, restaurants, entertainment, and one of the safest places to live in the country, and varied employment ranging from family-owned boutiques to Fortune 500 companies with a global reach. With all these resources, we should be able to attract and keep families who appreciate all that makes Deerfield a special place to live and work. However, I feel that the village's method to expand access to affordable housing misses the mark on many fronts. First, to quote Hillary Clinton, it takes a village. Unfortunately, the village's approach to squeezing developers to provide affordable housing set aside, set aside is, much, is both too narrowly focused and misses the opportunity to build community-wide support for the program. Um, anything worth doing should be done with the backing of the entire Deerfield community. I would shift the approach to insisting upon new to from insisting upon new developers setting aside a couple of units at below market rates because it generates only a couple of affordable units per project and is very uh, is vulnerable to the profitability of the project to the developers. We've seen that in the discussions today. My approach would focus on helping attract employers, large and small, to Deerfield, offering people good paying jobs at all levels from recent college graduates to senior level executives uh, who would enable people to afford market rate housing. Second, I would create a program to provide stipend to entry-level public sector employees, such as teachers, police officers, firefighters, and public works employees to assist them in affordable, affording market rate housing. However, unlike affordable housing programs that require developers to set aside a couple of units, my program would require support from the entire community. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. All right, uh, question number three. Go Green Deerfield has recently asked for a treat inventory. How do you think we should become environmentally sustainable? And we'll start with Ms. Ms. Oppenheim. Ah, a question close to my heart. I am by trade a landscape designer. So I uh, absolutely appreciate the need to protect and expand our tree canopy. Um, the reason Go, Go Green Deerfield is talking about this is because as we know, um, trees help trap carbon. They um, also, provide other benefits to us uh, in our community. One of the things that the village is doing right now is looking at a stormwater um, survey and we need to include trees in that as well. I advocate for the planting of rain gardens, for the planting of all kinds of uh, other um, uh, uh, plants that attract pollinators. We have uh, made every effort in the village to develop more sustainable services with um, picking up our refuse by recycling our new composting mm -hmm. um, efforts. And I certainly support those. We need to move forward with those more. We need to streamline as much as we can to encourage people to use less fuel, uh, less carbon uh, wet with their driving, more walking, more alternative energy vehicles. The list is so long. Um, there's an awful lot of things that we can do. And I think we approach it on all fronts. We educate people, we bring them into programs that work for them. Everybody can contribute in some way or another. And I think that it's such a big question and a big problem that we have to attack it on all fronts. So yes, I absolutely uh, uh, support having a tree study and every other kind of study that we can do to make sure that we're as sustainable and as environmentally sensitive as possible. Thanks. Thank you. All right, Mr. Benton. I salute, I salute the uh, Sustainability Commission. Uh, and the Go Green movement. We've supported them and will continue to support them. Uh, there are effects to all of these things from the transportation point of view, which is something I get close to 
We've talked about uh, hybrid, hybrid vehicles. We've talked about electric vehicles. We have to figure out in that how we do that. When you have electric vehicles, you have to provide facilities to recharge them. That's a question. We also have to take into the uh, effect what happens when we get more electric vehicles, what happens to our gas stations that develop cost uh, taxes for us and for the state. And that's another thing we have to do. Looking at trees, we have gone deeply into getting rid of some of the, uh, pardon me, Mary, trash trees, buckthorn and others that we've tried to uh, have people take out and to bring in some of the more beautiful and sustainable trees, where to put them, uh, what to do in penalties when somebody comes in and says, I don't like these trees or I'm gonna take them out. We have to have some type of code and we are doing that. So we're very active on that particular point. And again, to, to uh, talk about what Mary brought up, our look into the uh, trash pickup and our normal way of taking bids and getting better services at the same or lower prices. And especially because we're bringing in composting, not only that, but we're having a uh, tutorial through the company on how to do that is great. I think we are very environmentally sensitive and I know we will continue that for this village. Thank you. All right, Mr. Goodschneider. Thank you. Um, sustainability needs to be more than just a slogan. Um, I've been an environmentalist since I, since I was, grew up in Vermont. Um, I've been frustrated with um, the process that the village has used of late uh, when they missed several opportunities to put uh, substance behind their uh, sustainability uh, efforts. Uh, the police department requested $250,000 to purchase seven new SUVs for the fleet. Um, in, from my perspective, the village did very little due diligence to investigate the um, availability of a hybrid option, which uh, is marketed by um, Ford Motor Company, and it would have offered potentially $100,000 in fuel savings and corresponding carbon reduction over the four-year life cycle of the uh, police SUVs. Uh, in addition, the, the village uh, recently purchased 20 new laptops for uh, the village staff, and I suggested that we make the decommissioned laptops available to residents, uh, low, low income and needy residents in Deerfield, and I have, uh, haven't seen any progress on that. So um, I, I am in favor of the community solar programs. I signed up for myself for the program, our, our home, um, and I think, and I, in my role on the Deerfield Park Foundation, I pushed for a village garden that would have allowed uh, community members to have uh, uh, shared green space to have a garden and communi communal efforts. Um, I think there's plenty of opportunity that we have going forward to put substance behind our sustainability uh, slogans. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Smith Childers. Thank you. Uh, you know, I agree with really everything that's been said around the idea of what, what is going well when it comes to things like composting the tree projects. I like the solar energy project that we put forward. Uh, and, and yet also I agree fully, there's, there's a lot more we could be doing. I think in, in many cases, there are a lot of great efforts going on individually in some of the programming, how we bring those together and how we can make some further and longer looking commitments is gonna be really important for the village. You know, I, a lot of my companies that I work with, they're all looking ahead at climate and really thinking not just about today, but about five years out, 10 years out, you know, zero emissions, really thinking about what are we gonna to do to make massive change and yes, it takes time and planning and it's all very interconnected, but, and there's a lot to do today. And I think all of these things need to be wrapped up and looked at in a much more holistic way and thought about as what are we trying to commit to? What kind of village do we wanna be when it comes to sustainability? What does sustainability look like for the village? And where are our key issues that we're going to address? So all of the things I think that were stated are that, that are happening, I think are very encouraging. There's certainly progress. But if we look at how a lot of even the for-profit organizations of the world and other villages and, and towns are building a more sustainable future, they're doing it against a plan. And so I think there's a real opportunity there to build towards something more holistic. Thanks. All right. All right, on to the next question. 
We have an ordinance that bans assault weapons in Deerfield. What is your opinion of this ordinance or do you see a need for any additional ordinances or changes? And Mr. Benton, you'll begin this one. Yes, we have been tied up in the courts with the uh, ordinance for quite a while, but I think it's the judgment of most of us, if not all of us, that assault weapons, which is what this ban covers, is not necessary in the village. We don't have military problems here. We also are not planning to go into homes and look for uh, guns. That has been given as a, a, a no-no for us. And we understand that, and that's not part of this ordinance. But to have and keep assault weapons is not something that we need here in town. We have had gun clubs uh, who have offered to take assault weapons or other weapons that people keep in their homes under specific and very tight ordinances and store them so that they're not lost, but they can be used for practice in a controlled uh, circumstance. Um, it's something that uh, I think is not necessary. I'm strongly for it. Uh, I was the uh, chairman pro tem when the ordinance went through because our mayor was on vacation and I strongly believe in it. Uh, I have been criticized at one point because I didn't say enough in the meeting uh, to talk with the people who were objecting, but in my role as mayor pro tem, uh, that was not my job. My job was to conduct the meeting and I think I did that satisfactorily. We have been uh, kept in, uh, in progress, with, kept in touch with the progress through our attorneys and I certainly hope the decision is made and I hope the ordinance is upheld as it is in other communities. Thanks. Mr. Goodsnyder. Thank you. Uh, let me begin by saying that I understand that very few people are ambivalent on the topics related to gun ownership. And I acknowledge that I'm unlike, uh, that I'm unlike with my comments today to change too many people's views on the issue. Um, I do hope to give some additional depth to how I have arrived at my positions on this topic. Let me begin by saying that I don't personally own any assault style weapons. Next, my view on gun ownership in general has been formed primarily from three key issues. Gun violence has touched those close to me. My niece was a third grader at Sandy Hook Elementary School on that tragic day in 2012. And though she didn't sustain any physical injuries, she did lose friends and she copes with those what she witnessed that day uh, frequently. My office is located in the West Loop and a few, few years ago, my associate was robbed at gunpoint by a felon who had illegally purchased, possessed, and used a handgun. Since then, there have been frequent armed robberies and carjackings, and I often stay late at work to complete projects. I'm also a student of history and recognize the role guns play in self-defense and preventing against totalitarian regimes oppressing their own citizens. To me, never again is not just a slogan, as we recently witnessed people carrying Confederate flags into the Capitol and wearing Camp Auschwitz t-shirts. I fully favor the 2013 village ordinance that required safe storage of guns in families with young families. I'm sorry, guns in, guns in homes with young families. I favor current state laws that require background checks for gun purchases or possession. I favor red flag laws and increased funding for local police to enforce prohibitions against people whose firearm ID cards have been revoked. However, I oppose the 2018 assault weapons ban because it was unnecessary, unwarranted, and ill-advised. As the trial court and appellate court ruled, it violated state law by regulating handguns. And as the appellate court dissenting opinion stated, it was preempted by state law because the 2018 ordinance constituted a new rather than merely an amendment of the 2013 storage requirement. The matter is now before the Illinois Supreme Court and I'll await the resolution. Thank you, Mr. Good, good Your you. time has is, time is elapsed. Okay, Thank if you, you. want to co cover it in your closing statements. Thank you. Um, Ms. Metz Childers, you're next. Thanks. Uh, you know, my father was a policeman, so I grew up with his gun holster hanging in our front closet every day. My brother is a border patrolman, so he carries a weapon, and, I, and I'm really grateful for those that train and protect. But with that said, I am fully supportive of this ordinance. Um, I don't think assault weapons have any place in our community. They're used in some of the most memorable, memorable events of my lifetime, including school shootings, including Parkland. And as a mother, I certainly feel safer knowing that the village is doing this to reduce the number of people killed in mass shootings. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons to push against it, but I don't think it's ill-advised to recognize that mass shootings are decreased when assault weapons are banned. Thanks. 
Okay, Ms. Ms. Oppenheim, you're next. Thank you. I also 100% enthusiastically support the ordinance banning assault weapons from our community. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, no one needs an assault weapon. No one needs other than military. No other person needs to own an assault weapon. And it's our responsibility to try to keep our community as safe as possible as Rebecca referred to some of the, the heartbreaking terrible events that have taken place over the last few years remind us again and again and again of the danger of having these uh, instruments in our community. Um, the ordinance that was passed by the village was in our mind um, within our powers as a home rule community to pass. We met the requirements that the state set out, and that's what the litigation is about now. Our litigation is not being, um, the, the, the court is not ruling on any kind of second amendment issues. It's simply whether or not the village was able to make the decision on their own rather than as a state um, law. And I would love to remind all of our residents that the litigation that is going on now is being handled pro bono by um, Perkins Coey and the Brady Center to reduce gun violence. And it is not costing our residents um, money to uh, pursue this. So we feel that this is absolutely justifiable, that this is something that our community needs. And in fact, we're very inspired by some of the youth of our community who inspired us to go for this in the first place. So thank you. All right, thank you. All right, the next question is, um, as currently proposed, Deerfield will receive approximately $200,000 less in local government distributive funds from the state. How do you foresee making up that budget shortfall? And we're gonna start with Mr. Goodsnyder. Thank you. Um, my, my belief is that uh, with the uh, federal stimulus money that will be coming to the state and local uh, municipalities, some of that will be made up in terms of um, grants that will come through that $1.9 trillion. Um, other than that, I think the focus is going to be on um, just digging out from the hole that this last year put, put businesses and residents in, uh, fostering uh, businesses to support them in their growth and uh, rebounding, and uh, the, the campaign to, uh, local, to, to buy local is an excellent way to start, uh, and just continue to make our local businesses a valued uh, member of the community. All right. Ms. Ms. Metz, uh, Childers, you're next. Thanks. Um, I, I know we have a fairly strong budget and recognize that given what we've been through this year, it's gonna make sense to really defer some of the non-essential capital improvements for now. I, I recognize the board has an important role to play in thinking about what are really the infrastructure needs, the service needs of the village and thinking about cost, cost cutting, thinking about how to be very smart in vendor selection and look across the entire budget to, to pay attention to it for the next couple of years. It will be a little bit more difficult. Um, and I, I, I'm gonna probably uh, mirror a little bit of what Chris just said. I do think the more we can focus on building new businesses, really strengthening the businesses we have, bringing more residents to Deerfield, more shoppers to Deerfield, more people using Deerfield, the better position we'll be in. Thanks. All right, Ms. Oppenheim. Thank you. I I certainly agree with what Rebecca said about rebuilding our business community. Certainly that that's going to be important. There's some other things that we can do as well. Um, you know, the state has recently proposed uh, cutting back on our local government distributive fund um, tax money that we get from the state. They want to cut that back another 10%. So one of the things we do need to do is keep lobbying the state to make sure we do get our distribution that uh, our, our residents have paid in. And it's something that uh, we have gotten over the years and, and we need to try to recoup that as much as possible. Um, we'll postpone and we have been postponing uh, capital improvements. We need to sharpen our pencils uh, in terms of all of our other expenditures. You know, we have been 
fairly fortunate compared to other communities. We've had to do no layoffs to our staff and we have uh, fairly comfortable reserves that we have been able to move uh, funds around and cover our needs. In the future, if this continues, we're gonna have to look at staffing. We're gonna have to look at perhaps not replacing people as they go. I um, would hope that we don't have to cut our services. That would be the last thing that we try to do. But um, I do believe that we're gonna bounce back fairly quickly and um, we'll keep our fingers crossed. I, I don't see that any draconian measures at this point will need to take place, but we certainly have been looking very carefully at all the expenditures and we'll have to continue to. Thank you. All right, Mr. Benton. It's, Im <clears throat> it's important to note that uh, Deerfield has had and continues to have a top bond rating with all the financial companies. Um, we also do a, and, and this is something that uh, is an open procedure when we have a committee of the whole meeting uh, at just at, toward the end of our fiscal year to plan out our budget. Uh, it's a very careful and uh, thorough process when everybody is welcome to come and listen, but uh, we are very careful to look at what we had planned and uh, what we could think we can uh, get through in the budget year. Unfortunately, and without a great deal of recrimination, we have had a lot of state administrations who have felt that uh, this is a money pot which they can put their hands in because the state needs money too. And if you reduce what goes to the communities, they're not gonna miss it much. Uh, that's not really the case. We also have had the privilege of working with a mayor who has said, we wanna keep the property taxes level. And we've worked very hard to do that. But we have a very talented financial staff and they are very careful about not canceling projects, deferring them and combining them with others and looking very sharply at what the budget estimates come in at so that we can use any kind of a, uh, a surplus that comes from a lower than expected uh, estimate to do jobs that we would like to do but couldn't do this year, maybe we can do next year or combine with something where federal funds are available. So we have to keep a sharp eye out and we do. And I think we have to continue that so long as this problem with the pandemic and with reduced budgets uh, are available. Thank you. Uh, Pat, right. one more question and then closing. All right, great. Um, let's go to, uh, uh, how do you think trustees should respond to negative comments posted on social media? We're gonna start with uh, Ms. Metz Childers. Thanks. This comes up in my work as well. I work with a lot of executives uh, across corporations and they ask the same question. The first thing to note is that when people raise issues on social media, they're, they're doing it to be heard. That doesn't mean they need a full out response, but it might be pointing to larger issues or concerns that the village does need to address. So uh, definitely it's something that needs paid attention to. And with that said, sometimes people raise issues in a hostile way on social media because they feel a lack of transparency or that they don't have a voice in an issue. So there are times it's important to open up the conversation and ensure that people are part of it in an organized way. That doesn't, it's not always easy. It certainly sometimes drives discussion that can be challenging, but when it's done well, that's really when community is built. And there have even been times we've seen when it's done well, the person raising the more hostile issue thanks the leaders and is really appreciative to have been part of the process. So I, I think you take it by one by one and you look at it as a collective and you make sure you're responding to the larger issues at hand. Thanks. All right. Ms. Oppenheim. Thank you. Um, we frequently get people who are either don't understand an issue or disagree with an issue or a decision that's been made and um, as far as I'm concerned, I think it's very, very important to clarify misinformation mm -hmm. when, whether that goes to social media or it's a direct communication with um, any body on the board or to the village, it's extremely important to clarify to people when something is being misunderstood. And a whole lot of times I find that, um, 
once you clarify the information, there there's a level of understanding, and it certainly helps with cooperation, and you move forward from there. So I think that's very, very important. Um, as far as engaging, uh, sometimes if someone has a diametrically opposed opinion from uh, a decision that's been made or a discussion that's going on, a lot of times, um, it's not fruitful. I think people need to know they're being heard. I think you need to let people know you understand how they feel and what their issue is. But at a certain point, um, you need to thank them and perhaps agree to disagree. Sometimes that happens, it's unfortunate. Um, there's about 50 sides to every issue and people perceive things differently. And you have to appreciate that and be patient with people and try to explain as clearly as you can what your position is, what the village's position is. But um, I, I don't know debating back and forth how fruitful that is. Thank you. All right, Mr. Benton. We are at best a very receptive group of people. Uh, I am careful to look at the, uh, the various uh, social media pieces, uh, letters to the editor and so forth. Throwing a hand grenade on uh, social media doesn't really do much good. But um, I know if somebody has a problem, uh, I have been in the past and continue to be very receptive to talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, very often they don't understand the total situation. Uh, the phrase that comes up is, I didn't know that. I, I was totally unaware of that. I'm pleased to work with them to make that very clear, as clear as I can. Uh, in the meantime, our staff, if you write the village, our staff is very careful to get back to them and explain. I've had letters from people that said, I heard from the village manager or the assistant village manager and the problem was taken care of. We talked to public works or whatever and it was cured. Uh, also, we find that when there is something uh, that pertain that, per that seems to be that they perceive to be a problem with maybe a change in traffic or a new development, um, within about two weeks, it's forgotten. So we continue to be receptive and we continue to assure them that we're listening, that we will try and explain or take care of the problem. And after that, I think Mary's explanation of Sometimes you've got to agree to disagree, reluctantly takes place, but we are trying to do the best we can and I think we're accomplishing things. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Goodschneider. Thank you. Uh, to be frank, I'm not a, a strong, um, my strength is not in social media, so I'm gonna concede that. But um, with regard to the village, um, the, the village board meetings have an opportunity for public comment in two places in the meeting, uh, and which is somewhat effective in allowing residents to express their views, but does not actually provide a meaningful exchange of ideas because there's no uh, discussion back and forth. And it often leaves uh, the residents feeling that their opinions are disregarded or don't matter. So I would suggest that we take approximately 30 minutes before the start of every official board meeting to have an open forum with members of the community where they can have a dialogue between the trustee, the mayor, the village and the professional staff. And this would really give an opportunity to um, have their views expressed. And, and as Mr. Benton said, you know, maybe uh, give, be given an explanation for the hows and the whys that they weren't aware of. Uh, they could also, um, uh, anything that needed follow-up, they could be directed to the proper person or department uh, for further resolution. Thank you. All right. We have reached the conclusion of the question part of it. And now we'll start with the uh, closing statements. And as I said, we'll be starting from the reverse side of the alphabet and you have 90 seconds each to uh, state your case. Um, Ms. Oppenheim, you may go first. Thank you. Um, I've truly been honored to serve as a village trustee. I've learned a tremendous amount about Deerfield, our issues, our goals for the future. And I've tried to listen to all points of view with respect and an open mind in order to come to decisions that are fair and in the best interests of everybody in the village. Um, in seeking to continue as, in, as trustee, my goal is just to use the knowledge and the experience that I've gained to be more effective in serving. I've no single agenda. I have no access 
axe to grind. I'm passionate about all aspects of village governance. As a trustee, my goal has been to bring a common sense approach to balancing the needs of our residents with the limits of our possibilities. Uh, it's my job to make sure that every expenditure is necessary, it's being made in the smartest way, and that we address all of our critical needs. Meeting the challenges of the years ahead will require determination, creative thinking, and the ability to work within the entire community to find the best solutions. I believe that I've proven that I bring those qualities to the board. Um, we have a great tradition of a community involvement here, and I am continually impressed and inspired by the energy and the dedication of our volunteers. I'm proud to be part of that group effort. My family and I have had a great life here in Deerfield, and I am committed to helping shape the future of our town so that every family can say the same thing. So I thank you very much, and I thank the League for all they do for our community as well. All right, Ms. Metz Childers, you're next. You need to yeah, unmute yourself. Well, I think we have to continue. Can you hear us? Okay, what happened? Uh, well, you, uh, let's move on to the next. If she is able to come back, I'll, I'll plug her in. Um, Mr. Good Snyder. Thank you. Um, I have a foot in both uh, families, in, in both aspects of the village life, uh, families with school-aged children and uh, empty nesters. I have a solid working relationship with members on each of the area boards, school boards, park board, library board. Um, and I would uh, bring creativity, accountability, responsiveness, transparency, and independence to the board. I would favor term limits. We live in a town with a wonderful cross-section of professionals, uh, hundreds of which would be wonderful additions to the board. So one of my first proposals, if I'm elected to the board, would to be in, to uh, pass an ordinance requiring no more than two terms on the board. Um, I believe that uh, I would be able to ask hard-hitting hard -hitting questions and be analytical to the staff um, and bring a, a, a unique sense of um, uh, transparency and independence to the board if given the opportunity to serve. Thank you so much for the, to the, to the uh, League and to Ms. Wilder and to the viewers today who've taken the time to listen to our discussion. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Mr. Benton. When I started with uh, the commissions in Deerfield, I was amazed at the number of commissions and the number of people who volunteered. Uh, each Christmas time, we always had a reception that the village held for all of those people who volunteered. And Deerfield is rare because there was no one in Deerfield who is compensated for the work that they do. We're all, including the mayor, volunteers who donate our time to work for the good of the village. It is a very warm and inclusive group. Uh, the board particularly is like that. We all get along. Obviously we have our differences from time to time, but they're rather inconsequential as everybody looks at it. Uh, this has been a, a wonderful experience for me and uh, as I say, I am very impressed with what we do. We work hard. We spend a lot of time uh, learning the issues, talking with the uh, residents, trying to assist them in their problems, just as we mentioned in the last question. So uh, this is something that is very valuable. Uh, I think the league has done a wonderful job in bringing us all together, bringing some of these issues out and finding out what motivates us and what keeps us going. And uh, I look forward to being with this group and uh, thank you very much. All right, I see Ms. Smith Childers is back with us. Uh, I can yes. hear Okay. I, I can, but I apologize. We're in the middle of Georgia and it turns out the <laughs> connection is not as strong here as I'd like. Um, okay. Thank you. I, Go ahead and, and give, your, give, give your closing statement then. Yeah. 
Uh, well, I recognize that I'm a new voice to the word process, and I just think it's important to note what I'm going to really try to bring is curiosity and a focused attention to both what needs done and then a collaborative spirit and sometimes a challenging spirit as well. One of the most important things I'd love to consider is how to better engage with the community in our process and our discussions. And I'm just, I'm very excited to be part of the discussions and the decisions about how we revive our village within and following the pandemic, how we continue to ensure the village services are run well, how we manage our village finances responsibly, how we connect with our neighboring communities, how we think about a sustainable environment and how we partner with businesses and attract new ones. So I'm very much looking forward to this. I'm very appreciative of this opportunity to speak with you all. And I look forward to being part of the board if events lead us that way and to partnering with our great volunteers and staff. So thanks again. All right, we've reached the end. Thanks to all the candidates for participating in this forum and wanting to serve your community. Uh, thanks also to the Deerfield um, League of Women Voters for sponsoring this event. And Bonnie, uh, if you'd like to get, have some closing remarks. Thank yes, you. thank you. And thank you to um, thank you for attending the forum to all the, the people who are watching it here. Uh, we also want to, Kennedy's, thank you for participating and providing Deerfield residents with an opportunity to understand your positions. As you know, the forum was recorded and will be posted on the Deerfield League's uh, YouTube channel and the Illinois Voter Guide, which is put on by the, um, the state of Illinois. So it's the um, LWVIL uh, website for the, for the Illinois Voters Guide. Uh, the link to the recording will be provided to the candidates and will be posted on the uh, LWV Deerfield area Facebook page. And again, we remind you rebroadcasting or anything or limiting or ex providing excerpts of the proceedings or the recordings are not allowed. However, we hope that you will share the link out as widely as possible. And please don't forget to vote in the April 6th election. No one impacts your life more than your locally elected officials. We hope you will also uh, join us for our forums for the Deerfield School District 109 candidates on Thursday, March 18th at 7 p.m. and for the Deerfield Park District candidates on Thursday, March 25th at 7 p.m. Registration is available through the LWV Deerfield Area Facebook page. We hope to see all of you there and thank you again to, for attending and to our candidates for participating. Good afternoon. Thank you.